So um, first thing is I want to give you like a big picture with respect to climate change. Um, in terms of um, CO2 emissions, and carbon dioxide emissions, which are responsible for about 75% of the entire all greenhouse gas emissions, which are the cause, the human cause of climate change. Let me just tell you basically where we are. Uh, throughout the entire globe, uh, emission levels, CO2 emission levels, um, as of the most recent data, are about 33 billion tons. We're okay. about 33 billion tons per year of emissions. Now, if you take the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC's uh, estimates, and probably a lot of you have heard of them. It's the UN agency that has really taken the lead in synthesizing what I would call mainstream perspectives, because I'm, I'm not a climate scientist, so I'll just take this is a consensus among mainstream climate scientists. Okay, so what they're saying is that relative to where we are today, we have to reduce emissions, global emissions, by about 40%. Uh, well, it keeps getting closer. Um, let's say within 20 years. Okay. I won't say 2035, I'll say by 2035. So we have to reduce by 20, uh, by 40%, and then uh, by 2050, uh, which is 35 years from now, we have to reduce by 80%. There are other people that say we have to uh, push those numbers down further. For example, uh, James Hansen, the former director of climate research at NASA, says that those estimates are too conservative. But let's just go with those. So they are mainstream conservative estimates. Okay? We're at, uh, we're at 33 billion tons now. Uh, by 20, uh, within 20 years, let's say, we have to be at 20 billion tons. We have to be at 20 billion tons. That's a conservative estimate. By 2050, we have to be at about 8 billion tons. Again, a conservative estimate. Now, let me give you some other mainstream perspectives on uh, what the world is looking at. Uh, there are two big, big agencies that do energy modeling, climate modeling uh, for the world. Um, again, entirely mainstream. One is the International Energy Agency in Paris, which is part of the uh, OECD, uh, the Organization of uh, Economic Development, basically the European countries Okay. So here's their estimate. They have what they call current policies scenario. Okay, meaning if the world proceeds more or less like we're proceeding now, including the uh, environmental policies that we are uh, practicing now and would expect to integrate, if we proceed along that trajectory by 2035, Overall emissions will be 41 billion tons. Okay? We're 33 billion tons now. The conservative estimate of where we have to be to stabilize the climate, in, within, to start stabilizing the climate within 20 years, is 20 billion. But the International Energy Agency says if we proceed more or less as we are, including the policies that are in place, we will be at 41 billion tons. In other words, we're going to miss the target by 100%. <laughs> now, let's turn to the other big model, which is the US Department of Energy uh, and Energy Information Agency. Um, and I should mention that, uh, if, so I, have, I do have uh, these mainstream contacts myself, because I was a consultant for the US Department of Energy on uh, the Green Jobs Program under Obama. We can talk about that later. But anyway, if you want. But anyway. Okay, now let's look at that model. And they say, okay, they call it their reference case model for 2035, and they go out. Doesn't mean these things are right, but they're saying, let's look at the world as it's proceeding. And they do a projection, and they say the most likely scenario for 2035 is 41 billion tons. They come up with the same number, the two biggest models. The two biggest models, the most serious mainstream research programs on energy and climate, 
are both telling us the exact same story. That if we, if the world proceeds, and okay, I like Naomi Klein, that's a great song. This is not Naomi Klein's projection. This is the US Energy Department, and this is the International Energy Agencies. And if you read what they're saying, they're saying that if we proceed more or less as we are now, the world has no chance to stabilize the climate. So either we throw out climate science, we say, oh, it's all it's just all wrong. So we can ignore it. Or we have to take uh, drastic actions that deviate uh, substantially from what they're calling their uh, uh, reference case projections or their current policies projections. There's no choice, uh, as Margaret Thatcher would say, there is no alternative. I mean, there really is no alternative. Like, there is no alternative. Uh, <laughs> the two choices are either you toss out climate science, and if you want to, uh, you know, we can talk about this. You know, there are some climate scientists who do say <coughs> this. Not all this is nonsense. We, we can talk about them if we want later. But let's let's take the you know the consensus view as represented by the International Panel on Climate Change. So either you take them seriously, okay? Uh, and if you do, they're telling you we are have not even come close. To stabilizing the climate, the policy, and, and they do know that the, you know their policies. You know, Obama's doing stuff, China's doing stuff. Take all that, wrap it around, put it in your model. We don't even come close. That's the reality from the mainstream sources. Okay, that said, that's the uh, scary part. I'm going to make it a little less. Uh, so uh, research uh, that I've been doing. Um, with many people uh, at UMass, including Heidi uh, Garakelte, uh, Shogat Chakraborte, James Heinz, and Helen. Uh, yes, so I don't know if they're going to be teaching any of this. Helen Charter was definitely, you know, was my co-author and probably the first thing I published in this 2008. Uh, anyway, uh, the um, I think it's it's I think we can show pretty persuasively that you know a solution is at hand here. There is an anal analytically we can show a solution is at hand. The world actually does not have to burn up. Uh, and we can show that um, if we invest, if we invest, and we'll get to who I mean by we, but if we invest on the order of a percent and a half of GDP global GDP, every country, okay? I mean, some countries can do it a little differently, but basically, why not? A percent and a half of GDP every year in uh, energy efficiency, raising the efficiency standards for buildings uh, like this one, for transportation systems, for electrical grid systems, for industrial processes, for electricity generation. So invest in energy efficiency and invest in uh, clean, renewable energy. Uh, as we just heard in the song, we, we listed all the good energy sources. So yes, solar, uh, wind, uh, small scale hydro, geothermal. Uh, yes. Uh, actually, and again, the way I did the research with uh, people like Helen and Heidi, um, Again, we took, I took the estimates from places like the US Department of Energy, like the International Energy Agency, and um, said, let's take their estimates of how much it costs to build out these new systems, and how much green energy we can get, and how much savings we can get. And you, know, you crank that around for a long time, and you come out with this number, that roughly a percent and a half of GDP per year uh, would enable the world, and I can tell the story for different countries, but would enable the world to uh, get to a 40% emission reduction um, within 20 years. And to do so uh, without saying anything about cutting economic growth. We can debate whether we need to cut economic growth or not later. I say we don't, but I'm, there may be people who disagree with me, fair enough. But anyway, you can get to 
uh, a 40% reduction in emissions globally in the US, in India, in Indonesia, in Brazil, in Germany, and so forth, through this level of investment uh, in, in clean energy and energy efficiency in renewables every year for 20 years and then of course we keep it going after the 20 years and we transform the global economy from one generated uh, driven by fossil fuel energy and nuclear to one generated and, uh, and driven by green energy. And by the way, I, I am not assuming any increase in nuclear energy at all. In fact, I'm talking about eliminating nuclear energy as well. Okay. Now, uh, when, we, when we work on this solution, um, one of the things that's it's like so obvious for anyone that ever took high school economics, but that somehow got really lost in all the debates uh, for a long time, um, the, there is a myth. So Olivia said we were talking about myths. So here's a huge myth that's been holding back, in my view, uh, a, uh, a progressive uh, coalition between labor and environment. Which is, the myth is that sure, you can protect the environment, you can stabilize the climate, and the way you do it though is, you know, you've got to kill economic growth and jobs. And jobs are going to contract. And the working class is going to be worse off, but fine, we can save the environment. And so that's why you see in the paper, I see it in the New York Times every six, seven months, usually around election time, we have these uh, uh, polls, okay, uh, jobs uh, versus the environment. Which one is more important to you? Protecting jobs, uh, saving the environment, and you have to vote one or the other. That is the key driver behind the debates around the Keystone Pipeline, for example. Right? How can you take away jobs from people that need the jobs? I should tell you, I myself was at a conference uh, about a year ago when the um, policy director of the AFL-CIO, um, uh, Silver, what's his first name? Uh, anyway, okay. I, I said basically what I just said to you. And, uh, he literally went to the Zerk on it. I mean, like, like if one of you just started, stood up and just started screaming at me like 20 minutes. No, I'm, I, I'm telling you, that, that really happened. Uh, so uh, he just, he couldn't deal with it. Uh, and uh, so the, the problem is he's operating within, and many, many other people uh, with less goodwill are operating within a, a myth. The myth is that you can protect the environment or you can protect jobs, which you can't do. Okay, what our research shows, and again, Helen uh, was uh, one of the pioneers in producing this research, is, um, okay, here's the obvious thing. If you invest in anything at all, if you invest in fossil fuel energy, if you invest in digging holes in the ground, burying money, and then uh, digging more holes to, to take the money up, if you invest in cars, if you invest in the military, no matter what you invest in, you will create jobs. So then why is it all of a sudden that if you invest in building a green economy, it's bad for jobs? Okay, what's the answer? That's wrong. It's good for jobs. It is good for jobs. Building a green economy is good for jobs. Okay. So that's the first study that Helen and I did with Heidi and James Hines. Basically, that was the message. Uh, building the green economy is good for jobs. Now, the question is, of course, how good for jobs? <coughs> building a green economy is better for jobs than maintaining the fossil fuel economy. Okay? That's the big story. Building a green economy is much better for jobs than uh, sustaining a fossil fuel economy. With the case of the US economy, what we found was that investing in a green economy creates on the order of three times more jobs per dollar of expenditure than sustaining the fossil fuel economy. Good for jobs. Now, uh, Olivia was nice enough to mention I've been doing stuff in other countries, uh, including most recently in Spain, uh, working with the party of Podemos. Uh, and it, guess what? Building the green economy is good for jobs in Spain. And they're very happy to hear that because they have 23% unemployment. 
and they had the European Troika telling them that you have to uh, live under austerity forever. Okay, so building the economy is good for jobs. In all countries, there's not, without exception. Why? Uh, it creates more jobs per dollar of expenditure than investing in fossil fuel. Is that simple? A lot more. We can go into details as you wish. Now, it is true, and this is where, uh, I keep forgetting his person, Mr. Silver. Anybody know him? It's not that. Okay, here's where he gets emotional. And I don't blame him. Damon Silver. Okay. And uh, if any of you are friends of his, you know, and I'm talking smack about him, you can tell him that's fine. Uh, <laughs> he, he, I mean, he was outrageous. Just tell him. Anyway. Uh, Building the economy is good for jobs. It is not good for every single job. It is good for jobs in general. It is not good for jobs for coal miners. Kind of obvious. It is not good for, there will not be jobs for coal miners in 50 years. There will be some, but not very many. The coal mining industry is going to have to contract uh, by over 50% within 20 years. <coughs> And within another 35, 40 years, it'll be a, you know, a, a very small and modest industry. And so, building the green economy is not good for coal miners. And so what do you do about it? Well, you can go to meetings and scream, like David Silver did. Or you can talk about a just transition, as Olivier uh, mentioned, and is critical to the whole project of building a green economy, is recognizing, fully recognizing, uh, the hardships that will be faced by workers and communities uh, relying on sustaining the fossil fuel economy. Okay, so you just have to deal with it. When I did one of these studies for this think tank in Washington called Green Growth, the group is called uh, Center for American Progress, and they said, well, don't, don't say that. D don't say it's good, you're gonna lose jobs in the, in the coal industry. <laughs> What? Oh, so I'm just going to lie? Or, you know, it's not like, like it's a big secret. Like, it's really a deep plot here. If you, can, if you can track coal production by 50, 60 percent, guess what? There are going to be fewer jobs for coal miners. Uh, so part of, uh, you know, when I say a percent and a half of GDP, uh, one part of that one and a half percent of GDP is going to transition, just transition policy and other fossil fuel workers. The idea actually started with the late, great uh, labor leader, Tony Mazaki, who actually came up with the term just transition. But his first term was a super fund for workers. Uh, people didn't quite understand that because they didn't understand the reference. Uh, some of you might remember, we have a super fund that is a reclamation site for where toxic waste have been dumped. So Tony Mizaki's immortal, uh, Tony Mizaki was an officer uh, in the uh, Union of the Commonwealth Chemical Workers, and his phrase was, well, you know, we have a super fund for dirt. How about a super fund for workers? Okay, so that has to be part of the struggle, uh, not just in the United States, but everywhere. The fossil fuel industry is going to have to face the mines again. Quoting Margaret Thatcher, there is no alternative. So a lot of the struggle, and your song I think captured it well then, uh, is there, there, again, either you take climate science seriously, uh, or you just say all these people don't know what they're talking about, and you let, you, know, you let fracking go on. We can talk about a lot of reasons why fracking is disastrous in uh, Western Mass and elsewhere. But let, even if you put all of them aside, and you say, oh, we don't mind having contaminated water, um, just burning natural gas from uh, fat fracking operations also means if we're expanding it, if we're expanding natural gas production over the next generation, we will never hit the emission reduction goal. So there is going to have to be a struggle uh, against the fossil fuel industry. Now, how badly is this struggle? The struggle is going to be uh, very severe, with a lot of money at stake. There's the Koch brothers, uh, who are going to spend, they say, 
$900 million just in this next election. That's equal to the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. And their number one uh, economic interest is their energy company. And, and they're not really into green energy. Surprise. <laughs> now, I want to say about this that uh, this is a struggle. And it's a struggle that progressive forces have to win. There's no choice. But I, I want to tell you that the struggle shouldn't be uh, as hard as some people have made it out to be. We can, we can win this without having to conduct the equivalent of the abolition movement and the civil war. And I'm referring to uh, an article that I think was very well thought out, uh, and the people have picked it up. By uh, Chris Hayes, who's on MSNBC, wrote an article in the Nation and compared the struggle against the fossil fuel industry to the struggle that ultimately became the Civil War. And that makes things like saying really hard, right? I mean, millions of people died through the Civil War. I don't think we have to get, think of it that way. And I'll just give you a, a number or two. Uh, Carbon Tracker and the London School of Economics, the group, they put out numbers of the, the amount of assets owned by private fossil fuel companies, okay, and the value of those assets. Now keep in mind 90%, 85%, 90% fuel assets are owned by the public sector in different countries, okay? So part of the struggle is not just against private capitalists, but against public enterprises. So public enterprises are not, you know, innocent in all of this. But let's just talk about the private companies. So uh, they say that the value of the assets that have to stay in the ground and not burn is $3 trillion, on the order of $3 trillion. It's a lot of money. Nobody's giving up $3 trillion without a fight. Uh, but $3 trillion is actually manageable for our, from our side. Why? Well, if you say it's going to go in 20 years, that's $150 billion a year of reduction. Okay. Uh, now, uh, in 2008, when we had the financial crisis, the value of personal assets, household assets in the United States, in one year collapsed by $17 trillion. Six times, five, six times more than what we're talking about over a 20 year period for the fossil fuel company. So don't get disturbed. We must defeat the fossil fuel industry. They will have to exterminate. But it is not going to require the equivalent of the Civil War. OK. Now, on the positive side, uh, building a green economy is going to create huge opportunities for cooperative enterprise, small-scale enterprise, uh, and various kinds of forms that I'm sure Emily is going to talk about in a minute. Uh, why? Uh, well, for one thing, we can think about uh, so-called distributed energy systems, which do not require utilities at all, right? You can have a, a wind turbine in your community. You can have solar fields. You can have uh, energy distributed within your community without any connection to a big utility company. Uh, this is why we recognize the utility companies are, of course, not happy about the news. But even the Financial Times, the organ of global capitalism, in the story in January 2015, uh, reported that the Edison Electric Institute, the US Electricity Industry Association, warned that the utilities were facing, uh, quote, disruptive challenges comparable to the way the traditional landline tele telephone industry was uh, shaken up by the emergence of mo mobile telephone technology. Uh, in other words, this is something that is sitting there uh, waiting for us to seize and benefit uh, from and to create new forms of ownership, small scale ownership, community ownership. Um, it won't happen on its own. It won't happen on its own. And of course, there are big investors who want to recreate a structure, a capitalist structure, comparable to what we have in the fossil fuel industry. But it is an uh, open possibility. It is there. And I want to just close by giving one example of this. 
which is um, a rural community in uh, Germany, which is called uh, Free Free Man. Okay, in Germany's Black Forest, which is run entirely 100% through renewable energy. Now, note this is in Germany. They don't have all that much sun. Okay, they have less sun than we have probably in average. They don't have a lot of wind. There is nothing special about this community, including the fact they don't even care so much about climate change, it turns out. But all the better to study this community, okay? Let me read to you uh, a quote from a study that was done in this community by researchers from UC Berkeley. Okay, here's what they said. The residents' motivations for undertaking the project were strongly connected to community interests as opposed to awareness of climate change. The residents and local government were more concerned about their own benefit from the project and its influence on their local surroundings. They create new income streams, have positive effects on the community's image, and are a way to strengthen rural areas by establishing a regional value-added chain. Especially for rural areas, energy projects are a chance to foster regional development to secure agricultural holdings and to conserve cultural landscapes that have been shaped by agriculture over centuries. So here we have an example of people that aren't committed environmentalists, but see the benefits that are emerging through building a green economy. Overlay onto people like that all the things that we all here know about the imperative of building a green economy precisely to stabilize climate change. I think we have a vision of how to win this political struggle. Thank you.